Good afternoon, everyone. And welcome to IOM. My name is Bernard Mariano. I am the director of uh, ICT. Uh, I was given the task to uh, welcome you. Uh, welcome to, to this, to celebrate with us the beginning of the end of the unconscious bias. <laughs> the beginning of the end. Um, I'm delighted to have you here and we are grateful for the panelists that, uh, for taking their time from their busy schedule to be here with you and with us. So let me introduce the panelists before uh, we, go, we get to the movie. Uh, uh, far right is um, Kyle uh, Ward, Kyle Ward, right? Chief of Program Support and Management Services for Human um, OHCS HR, so. such as <laughs> Human Rights. <laughs> the Human Rights Commission. And we have uh, next to Kyle, uh, Kate uh, Gilmore, is the Deputy Director General for no. Deputy High Commission. Deputy High Commission. Sort of like a mediocre commission. <laughs> Now we have the Deputy Nurse General, Ambassador Laura Thompson, the Deputy Director General for, yes, for yes, IOM. And finally, we have uh, uh, just next to me um, Tanya, Tanya Odom, the facilitator that will help us through this process. So she will take over from me and so as soon as we watch the video. Right? The video was produced by internal staff, IOM and human rights staff. Uh, some of the actors, you will recognize them here. Uh, let me take the opportunity to thank those actors, producers and directors for, for taking their time and, and do this extra additional task that is normally under, listed under as a, any other task as assigned by supervisor to make the movie. And this is a good collaboration between UN and human rights. So uh, I think it shows that, um, that the, the two agencies are trying to address this common problem and common challenge. Um, and it's working from today, the two, two D, D, Geez. One DG and one Deputy High Commission, High Commissioner uh, are present here, and and it's the staff IOM and, and the Human Rights Commission who work together for that to make this a reality. To make the content relevant, the team also sought the, the uh, feedback from consultants to make sure that. Uh, uh, the concrete recommendations on how to address the, the difficult issues are factored in. And uh, this video will be live today at 2.30. Uh, from 2.30 it will be available on YouTube, so you can watch and watch again and watch again. <laughs> many times as you want. <laughs> <laughs> please, please, Share it and retweet it and, and just multiply it. I also I also thank the, I also I also want to take the opportunity to thank the, the Belgian government for the generous support given to produce this, this video and uh, and 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 the t two teams and thanks to that support financial support from the Belgian government we were able to to deliver what you will see today. And I think it's enough of me. And it's time to watch the, the video. So. so, you've been a hiring manager for a while now. You know your job well, and you go through each recruitment confident that your decisions are made professionally. But are you sure your decisions are based on integrity and respect for diversity? How do you make sure you are choosing the right person for the job without any bias? Throughout the day, we tend to make assumptions based on the affinities or differences we have with certain groups of people. 
As our brains receive millions of pieces of information each second, we create shortcuts based on preconceived ideas or past experience in order to make decisions quickly. Doing so, we tend to have preference for people that we perceive as familiar or similar to us. So, how does unconscious bias affect you when hiring? How does it put you at risk of missing out on the best qualified candidate and missing out on contributing to the diversity of the team? As a hiring manager, you are trusted to make these types of decisions daily. And here comes the first. Hi, this is Wu Weixia on the line. Can you hear me? Hmm, should you call her Weixia or Wu? Ah, let's see. First name Weixia, 32, Chinese, hmm, wonder about her French. Oh, she spent three years as a field coordinator in South Sudan. Yes, it's quite challenging. Women often have to provide more evidence of competence to be seen as equally capable. But not in the UN system, right? In studies where equally qualified candidates were considered, mothers were 79% less likely to be hired. Women take five and a half years to get promoted to a P4 level, whereas men take four and a half years. Hmm, I guess she was lucky to be led by such a charismatic chief of mission on that project. Actually, I took the lead on that particular project. The words and attitudes of male and female candidates are usually assessed differently. In performance review, women received two and a half times the amount of feedback men did about aggressive communication styles. Not a big deal, is it? Overall, more men work in hardship duty stations than women. And while 30% of applicants are women, they are not being selected. Hmm. So what prompts her to apply for a post at HQ? Well, I guess it's time for me to settle down for a bit. So she'd like to become a parent. Won't that be too difficult to combine with a career? The family and personal aspirations of women are often a break on their careers. Having children is seen as a hindrance to their career progression by 62% of female staff. At senior positions, 16% of males versus 40% of females are more likely to be divorced, separated or single. Wait, aren't we being a tiny bit biased? And how about you? Yes, you watching this video. Are you ever biased? We all have biases, regardless of our gender, nationality or position. Will you let your bias get in the way of hiring the best candidate for your team? I thought not. Here is what you can do. 1. Recognition. The first step is to recognize your own unconscious bias and that of the panel, taking a few concrete steps to mitigate biases. 2. Priming. Prime your brain to make decisions based on objective criteria before looking at their qualifications. Have each member fill in the evaluation template individually to avoid groupthink. 3. Impartiality. Put aside your gut feeling towards some candidates, in particular during the first five minutes of the interview, making sure you guide all candidates equally, both in your tone and in follow-up questions and comments. By allowing for a pause during interviews, panelists can have a chance to discuss any biases and refocus on the job criteria before concluding the interview. 4. Diversity Out of the best qualified candidates, choose the candidate that will bring the most diversity into the team in terms of gender, geography, background. Make sure to have the facts about the team composition to be able to do this. Teams with a maximum of 70% of the same gender, nationality or ethnicity perform better than more homogeneous teams when the leadership is inclusive. And finally, accountability. Collect data disaggregated by sex and nationality at all stages of recruitment and include them in the final recommendation file to the head of the organization. The data will tell you where you should start and how you are doing moving forward. What will you make sure you do differently next time you hire? Take a step forward and make those values a reality, starting in the UN. You can begin now by forwarding this video to a colleague. Um, thank you to the panelists for being here. And before I uh, ask for your reactions and some thoughts, I just want to also publicly acknowledge Theodora Sayori and Beatrice for working on this, and Theodora for really just organizing this, coordinating this, and working on this. So if we can also give them thanks. Okay. So to our panelists, um, and maybe we go 
but this way first, starting with you, DTG. Um, why do you think, what do you think about the video, your reactions, and why do you think this is important? Well, thank you very much. I'm, I'm really happy to, to see all of you here. I, I still wanted a little bit more men in the room. Uh, I made a pitch this morning, but it didn't work. Uh, so anyway, uh, really happy to have everybody here. And thank you very much, Kate and, and Kai, for being here. Uh, well, I think the first thing is, it's a fantastic video. And it yeah. shows exactly what is happening. Uh, I think one of the very the most important thing that I personally learned when we got a, uh, the opportunity of being uh, trained by, by Tanya about this is that we all have unconscious biases. And that is not a reality that doesn't affect us because we are women, even with regard to gender issues, but it, it, it's also much broader than that. And we have to realize that as a first step in, in order to try to address it. I think the video brings it very clearly to all of us that indeed there are issues that we all have and that we, there are ways of tackling them. Maybe not <coughs> getting rid of all of them because probably that is almost impossible since the moment that they are unconscious. Uh, but nonetheless, that there are ways to avoid them when we are making selections. And I think this is the message that we want to pass and this is the the, the way that we want to raise awareness of everybody and try to avoid it in the future as much as we can. At the end of the day, what we are facing in organizations like IOM, and I'm sure that uh, in other organizations in the UN system is exactly the same thing, is that even though we have a real commitment of doing progress on gender issues, on diversity issues in general, uh, and we have a real commitment coming from the top, we don't make enough progress. And the reality <coughs> is the numbers, and we can see the numbers, and we see that after five years, I have been in IOM now almost eight years, and I have to say, we have failed to make the progress that we wanted to make. So that's when, and I will explain later a little bit, what have we done in order to, to really get to the point that we are today. But I think this is a, an extremely important starting point for all of us here. Thank you. Thank you. Deputy High Commissioner Gilmore, what would you say? Your reaction? Um, <laughs> <laughs> I was startled. Um, you know, uh, I, I'm so excited to see this asset created. I, I thought Merrill did a great job. Not as good as Brad. Angelina, perhaps, uh, could have lifted it. Seriously. I, I think to be at this launch at this moment in partnership with IOM is a thrill for us. I mean, we're very honoured and I, and I just want to say thank you to the courageous colleagues who led on this project, who allowed us uh, to receive this gift, and it is a gift to our organisations and far beyond us. And thank you, Laura, and thank you uh, for the generosity of IOM and working with the uh, uh, OHCHR, UN Human Rights, on, on this important work. Uh, for me, it's a thrill to see something that's practical, that's solution-oriented and confronting. Um, I affirm very much, you know, the issue is not to, to imagine or arrive at a supreme state where bias is not present. The real problem is when we don't make those biases conscious and really challenge ourselves. And I, and I love the way the film makes it doable and practical and in that way removes all excuses from us all in regards to how we grapple with the biases that, for which there is no inherent shame in the first instance. What is shameful is when we don't own them, admit to them and work on them very, very hard. I myself am an Australian. Is there any New Zealander? I'm <laughs> <laughs> just saying. No, it's a problem. I'm working on it. Can you do better than that, please? Let me start off by saying I am not from New Zealand. Oh, yeah. oh, clearly. That's why you're doing your work. <laughs> Otherwise, I probably wouldn't be sitting right now. That's my point. <laughs> hard to come after these two, but I think, you know, in respect of the, of the video, 
what I think makes it very powerful is that it's very recognizable. Yeah. Everything that comes up there, there's no, mm -hmm. there's no, oh wow, no, it's it's all something that we know, that we've seen, that we have had to deal with at various times. I have to say, being relatively well educated myself in, in a number of years and working with with colleagues on, on issues of, of gender sensitivity and mainstreaming. My first reaction when we got to the starting point of this video was, oh, come on. A white guy has to be the boss? I mean, really? They couldn't have put you know, a woman there? So of course, we had that aha moment. It was, it was good. It was Thank you, Meryl. So perfect. That really was good. Um, so I think you know, the issue, you can't, you can't hide it up that the recognition of it is important because you know, it is kind of part of the furniture. But you have to really consciously think, okay, I am not, you know, I'm not looking at that, I am not thinking about that, this is, we have to have, make sure that we have a, a, an open playing field. And I guess we're gonna, I'm not going to get ahead of myself and talk to some of the other questions that you're going to be asking us, but there are obviously many things that we can do, some very important ones highlighted here, but I think a lot more that we can also do in terms of trying to turn that around for the future. So, so if you want to hold the mic for a bit, let me let me ask you this question. Thank you. Um, we the, we have, the way we're going to do this is I'll ask them each one more question and then we'll go to you. So start your brains thinking, please. Not that they're not, <laughs> but just just priming your brain. But I'm wondering, um, we saw some of this in the video, but as someone who sort of hires people and understands the role of leadership, what do you think are some of the constraints of hiring managers in trying to hire a diverse candidate pool? What would you say? Oh gosh, I mean, frankly, the, there's a lot. There's, first of all, just the candidates that apply. I mean, you're obviously you're always constrained by what you have. But I think the starting point there is really that we don't have professional hiring managers generally. Mm -hmm. People are doing this mm -hmm. on top of their workload. Mm -hmm. And you oftentimes find yourself in the conundrum that you don't really have enough time to devote to it because you're trying to fill the post. Mm -hmm. And you can't get the person on the job to help you because you're hostage to the process. So time is always one of the critical issues that you're facing. People want to try and get through this as quickly as possible. Oftentimes, I know certainly um, in human rights, I assume you probably have similar circumstances here, when you get a, a list of candidates for any opening, there can be hundreds of candidates there. So you're kind of desperate to find ways to screen through them, to find a way to, to narrow down that field to something that you can actually work with. And, you know, so you're flipping through very quickly, and what do you do? You're focusing on things that jump to your attention, things that you recognize, things that, that mean something to you. And here is something very important. We value what we know. There's, you know, we know a certain number of universities, for instance, are world known or, or well known for, for producing high quality candidates. Do I know anything about them? Australian universities or, or universities in, in China or in the Philippines or somewhere else? Not really. So I'm gonna, the ones that are going to catch my eye are the ones that I know. Same thing with, with other parts of people's experience, where they've worked, what they've done. Um, so have, opening your eyes beyond that point in the very initial stages, I think, is, is very important. The, the time is really important. There's also issue, issues of other types of unconscious bias, not just the unconscious bias to, to to gender, which is, is very well known and, and quite straightforward, but there's also the, you know, other cultural biases. Um, when you're conducting interviews, when you're talking to people who are conducting tests, linguistic abilities is one very important one. What languages do we do the tests in? What language are we speaking right now? English. If you're a native English speaker, boy, are you lucky. Mm -hmm. If you're not, you're that much more challenged to be able to present yourself as eloquently as you can in your mother tongue. Um, so they're also testing or interviews need to be conducted in multiple languages to the extent that you can, to the extent that it's viable and, and valid also for the work that you're conducting, you need also to be able to, to, to focus on that and include people there too. There's also the issue of disabilities. People with disabilities, how are we unconsciously biased against them? Someone shows up for an interview in a wheelchair. You think, okay, um, do we actually have the equipment requirements? Is it going to, how is it going to work? What if this person has to travel? You know, you may automatically start formulating things in your brain before you even get to the questions or you even look at their qualifications. So all of these things, you really have to, to, to 
unfortunately, there's no way around it. You have to, to take a little bit of extra time to be able to be sure that you're giving the full and careful uh, consideration to, to every client. Yeah. Kind of yeah, I mean, I think, and we know this from the research, and those of you who I worked with or been through sessions, something you said I just want to highlight, and that is under stress, time constraints, and deadlines, unconscious biases are triggered even more. So if we think about what you were just saying, if I have 100 candidates, but I have to fill this post, what does that mean, right? I think that's a really important point. Um, Deputy Head Commissioner, you know, you all in this panel are thought of as gender champions. So you're thought of as people who understand this, um, as people who also understand diversity. I appreciate that you've all expanded this because I think what we've been trying to do in all of our work is to say when we talk about unconscious bias, we're using it as a way, a lens through which we can look at other things. So what do, you're known as a gender champion, as you all are. So what can be done to tackle these invisible biases and promote diversity? And what have you done? <laughs> what have I done? <laughs> well, I should start with an apology. <laughs> In that case, <laughs> no. I, 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 you know, there's something deeply significant for the United Nations and multilateral system that we are not recreating participation, equality, and engagement in the character of the world we serve. And I would like to say that uh, this is the absence of appreciation of diversity in all its forms and a mirroring of the world that we serve is an impediment at the strategic level to our delivery. So for me this is, um, I, you know, I'm going to be quite pragmatic about it. We will not um, be what we need to be in this world until we invite the world into us. And therefore I, I think of this as very multivalent. It is uh, definitely about intersectionality and multiplicity of identities, uh, including class. And I, I think one of the, the difficulties for the UN system is its elitism mm -hmm. and its creaming of elites around the world rather than um, uh, an, uh, an opportunity employer. And I, I think this is a, a, huge, uh, a huge problem. Uh, but secondly, I think there's very little understanding of key parts in the house, including at leadership, that who you are affects what you do. Mm -hmm. And that one of the reasons why our relevance is being crit criticised, why we're seen as somehow northern, when in fact we're working on a universal agenda, and why, uh, in fact, I, I just came from a conversation with the the new, uh, you know, the Deputy Secretary General and her team with uh, the transformation. And the messages back on who we are as an international system tell us that without getting diversity built into us by age, by disability, by geography, uh, including, of course, a gender, uh, minority, intersex, LGBTI, without that, we've, we, our inherent authenticity is diminished. And so for me, coming into um, OHCHR specifically, mm -hmm. I, I felt very quickly from colleagues the pain of the gap between what we stand for and who we are. And uh, with great colleagues like Sari and uh, others, including our staff committee and uh, uh, wonderful support from uh, Kyle and, and managers and so on, we have really worked hard over the last 12 months to shift not so much uh, uh, the, the hard evidence that we're more diverse, because there is a time lag in that, but to open a conversation inside the house so that there is permission to express the disappointment, the pain, the resentment, the anger and the frustration. That there should be such high levels of tolerance for what has to be bias if we're to explain the demography of our staff profile. It is too white, it is too male, it is too old. <coughs> I want you a specimen. <laughs> Everyone is an exception. I'm being very frank with you. Just because because <laughs> um, and, you know, trying to understand one of the greatest uh, barriers we have to overcome is the silence 
in of these of discussion of these issues. The taboo nature in owning the racism, the sexism, the ageism, the homophobia that that flourishes in organisations that do not challenge unconscious bias. So we, we're trying to talk about. We of course have targets. We of course doing a number of other things, but. Somehow, this precious internal conversation between us all as a community to air that which flourishes in silence, that for me is one of the most important things. As imperfect as uh, um, no doubt then our efforts may be structurally or in policy or in procedure, provided the conversation is open and people feel safe to be brave and forthright, then um, I do believe we can change more rapidly. Uh, so I don't think it is only procedural here. And finally, I might say, I, I think it's time the UN thought about crafting its own identity. Uh, because, you know, we have multiple identities. We also have identities, UN and international staff, and we love the fact that um, uh, we're working closely with IOM on this because we can articulate an identity that is rooted in diversity rather than be fatalistic about the identities with which we were born, which were then reconstructed back to us by unconscious bias. The passivity in allowing unconscious bias to tell us who we are is something we absolutely have to challenge. Yeah. And you know, before I get into um, Ambassador Thompson, I just want to say that both IOM and OHCHR, so I've done unconscious bias work in 15 entities in seven countries at this point. And IOM and OHCHR were two of the first, including WMO, ITC, who are also in this room. They also are taking risks. And I've been in rooms with both you and with Ambassador Thompson where you actually have challenged people on things they said. And so that accountability note at the end of the video on what can be done, I don't want to surpass that because at this point I've been in enough spaces in the UN where things go unchallenged and to your point where things aren't spoken, and both of you, I've been in spaces with, you know, for these types of sessions where you've spoken up. So for me, that's just something I want to put out there, that there's a model for how we sort of look at this issue of accountability. So Ambassador Thompson, just how do you think this video and the work that Iowa is doing around unconscious bias and diversity um, can help change the path for women and others moving forward? Well, I think first of all, uh, uh, most importantly, what we want is basically to raise awareness. I, I think we, we need all to understand what is happening inside of us. Uh, and I fully agree with Kate that, uh, you know, we have, you have, you said, two white, two male, and two old. Well, I don't think you're looking at me. I don't know why I, but you, you have to represent the real <laughs> <laughs> that, that's our reality, absolutely. And that's the reality of the whole UN. It's, exactly. it's, it's not you exactly. and us, it, it's what we are. Uh, it, it has historic reasons, uh, and it has a lot of unbiased, uh, unbiased also, uh, things that have come to yeah. create a workforce that, that represent the powers that existed in the past. The reality of today is a completely different reality, uh, and we have to adapt our uh, our own population to be able to serve better the populations that we are serving. That, in general terms, are not too white, <laughs> too male, <No>. and, and <laughs> too old, <laughs> but are exactly the opposite. So, in general terms, that's that's our reality. So, it, it's 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 in a certain way a contradiction that we have. Now, in Iron what we did, how do, did we get here? Because I, I think it is important. Uh, when, when the Director General and myself came to Iron, we put as one of our priorities to increase the number of female senior, at the senior level, uh, colleagues, because there was a big gap. Uh, whereas we have in P2s and P3s a more balanced uh, workforce, in, in the higher levels, it, it was extremely that. So uh, something like between 50 and 20, or 10 even. Uh, so we did a conscious effort. We took some administrative measures in order to, to, to get there. And five years after, we sit down and said, we have done almost no progress. Small progress, but not really consistent with 
the commitment that we both have and with the you know the efforts that we have made. So we did something wrong. And one of the things uh, we got a group of uh, people we got together and said, we we said well why women are not progressing uh, in our ranks uh, and and. I was leading that discussion and, and we get different views about, yeah, probably because women abandon their career or because they don't dare to apply or because they don't go to different difficult locations. Anyway, a, a variety of views and there, there was a point that we said, okay, we need to know why. And that, that's the first thing. We need to know why. What are we doing wrong? And we did a serious study that got into looking at gender and diversity, not only gender. In Aga, but diversity as well because we have the, the other problems as well. So, and what, that's where we found out a, a series of uh, data that gave us uh, much, much more hard evidence of what we, we were doing wrong. And that's when we found you. <laughs> <laughs> a moment of uh, absolute delight for, for us. So we uh, started looking at unconscious bias at the selection process because it's the most important part uh, and it's the only way that we are going to change our workforce. Uh, so Tanya came to us and we started doing a, a great work with her. Uh, we did a training of our senior management team. We realized that that is not enough. Then we did a training of the whole uh, chief of missions of IOM in one meeting that we had. That is not enough neither. Um, we went uh, and started developing specific trainings at country level and with the, with the regional offices. And we have done something like five or six now uh, in different uh, contexts, in different uh, cultural uh, environments. We did it in Panama, we did it in Somalia, in Nairobi, in uh, Djibouti, in Cairo, and Burundi. Uh, in Cairo, uh, we are doing now in Vienna, after. So, anyway, we are trying to do, but we are also, as part of this, and Kate and I have been in, in, in those with you, we have done also female leadership training, because it, it is extremely important, because we have to recognize it, recognize it ladies, that we do not apply very often because we see a list of 10 uh, requirements and we have nine <laughs> and one we don't and we say, ah, oh, we are not qualified, no, this is not. Whereas the men do the opposite. They see not 10, they don't fit one nine, they see one and they go And it's amazing, and sometimes they get it. <laughs> so we, we are part of the problem. Uh, and we have to recognize that because if we continue saying that we are excluded by the others and we don't take our own responsibility, then we are not going to, pro to progress in this. At the end of the day, we all have unconscious bias, and I come to, to a DVM here. We have to realize that we have also unconscious bias when we deal with others, but that we, ha we can find ways of fighting it. And I think the video. And this getting it has to become viral. You know, how many are we here? I don't know, maybe 70, 80? No. I want like 100,000 hits by tomorrow. <laughs> okay. <laughs> because because it's, that's the way that it, you make these large. We didn't have a bigger room. Uh, we didn't have enough men here. Uh, but uh, all the men that are not here should see it at some point in the next week. In, in order to make it really <coughs> good. Thanks. So now we're going to open it up for a couple of questions from you. What questions do you have for the panel? Or, or, and or reactions to the video? Anybody? If you stand up, I can repeat your question, maybe. There's a question right here. Yeah. Thank you, Peter. Hi, um, my name is Claire Hayworth. I'm from the GCSP. Um, and I'm leading on gender and inclusive security. I have a really controversial question. Um, so, biases we know are based on stereotypes, and one of the biggest stereotypes is around parental responsibilities and caring. Google has done Pew Analytics to see where their talent loss is coming from, and it's from the women that are leaving because they're finding it too tough. Yeah. And I've got two young children, I know it's tough. What are you thinking about shared parental leave that's mandatory for men and women that will challenge stereotypes for both? 
encourage that shared responsibility from the beginning and really get to the heart of what's forming the biases around women's responsibilities, which actually are often a reality. Um, I know Baker McKenzie, a lot of the management consultancy firms have implemented this. The private sector are actually leading the way and it would be really wonderful if the UN as a human rights institution could say actually men have equal rights too in terms of their responsibilities at home. And this is a, a really fundamental policy thing um, that we can make to move the needle both in terms of perception and reality. Thank you. Who wants to start? The one in charge. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's interesting. The UN is better than some in terms of maternity leave. It's still kind of a medical concept rather than a parental responsibility concept. And since the time when I had young children, men now do have the possibility of taking parental leave as well. What is it, two weeks? Four. Four weeks, okay, four weeks. See, I don't, I don't know, because I never have to do it. But still, four weeks. How on earth are they able to, you know, to actually contribute during that period. Yeah, it may be great postpartum when they really need some extra assistance to help out around the house. But after that, pff, there you go. It's, it's, it's normally the mother's responsibility. Uh, I think it's a great idea that, that parental leave should become the norm rather than maternity leave as such. I mean, keep, the, keep the medical aspect of it, which is very important. Frankly, as we all know, four months passes like that. How on earth can you possibly organize yourself and you know, participate in, in all the incredible moments of, of a young life in that short period of time. So I agree, the idea of having a parental leave responsibility entitlement as well as the maternity leave that can then be shared by both men and women. The idea of, of mandatory, I think, is, is quite interesting. Um, a, great, a great idea, one that we'll have to take forward. I mean, obviously, now, you're part of the same system that we were part of not so long ago. I guess you had a little bit more flexibility on your own. Now we have to fight the beast that is uh, UN headquarters. But it's an excellent idea. <laughs> <laughs> I am not the great one. That's not for the record. <laughs> <laughs> no, we didn't. When he says the beast, here. he meant feast. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> feast that is the secretary. Yeah. <laughs> I <don't know. laughs> I, I think uh, I think we are still. Uh, this is extremely important, but but I think we are still too traditional as organizations. Uh, to be honest, uh, it's difficult to move into that direction. Even you know, uh, home and working for home and, uh, or other type of concepts that uh, can facilitate uh, gender access and equality it are are difficult for us. Uh, we, we are not good at measuring either uh, and controlling uh, and as a result we are afraid that people that are going to be working at home are going to be doing something else and not, they will not be working. So I, I think there is a lot to do in order to be able to get there. Uh, it is important to do it but, but it, it is not as easy as just take a policy decision. Mm -hmm. uh, it has to be supported by a whole system behind. Uh, that private companies have mm -hmm. and that works well because they have a different way of uh, you know, accounting for performance uh, whereas international organizations I don't want to say that, that we account performance by our sitting in the office uh, but uh, uh, it, it, we, we are not as good as accounting <laughs> in that sense so I think it, it is easy to talk about it uh, but it's a, it, administratively, it's not that easy to, do, to get there. And I think we need to do a whole big process uh, in order to get there. And, and just to build on the wonderful intervention, and thank you for it, the example, I mean, let, let's recall that families are not just men and women, are they? Mm -hmm. I mean, let, let, let's explode out the bias of the nature of caring. Mm -hmm. This can be men and men, it can be women and women, it can be a single parent. And it can be not just the newborn, but the aging parent. Mm -hmm. I mean, in fact, what the aspiration has to be, that we find a work-life balance that enables us to do the work for people who have far less than we have. And every time we uh, advantage or seek to be in world-class 
terms and conditions. Let us be very clear where the costs of that come from in terms of our program work. So I think we have to live very humbly with our privilege in the UN and very critically with our privilege, particularly in a place like Geneva. But that being said, there's even the way we narrate our story of the balance between uh, work and life, I think, can have bias in it. And we have to really be very challenging to ensure that we haven't locked out people on the basis of, you know, um, more stereotypical ideas, as you said, about who cares for whom. Okay. Yeah, and I, that was going to be my addition, that the, I, I appreciate you both connecting it to larger issues other than just maternity leave, because in fact, woven through the maternity leave systems oftentimes are biases, as we know. And the other thing is, connecting to what um, Ambassador Tunson said, that the research done by McKinsey around uh, work-life balance policies about a year and a half ago talked about the fact that men have to take advantage of them too in order for them to be important, right? But again, this whole piece about policy is one thing. I can tell you after being in many entities, they may have a policy on the books, but if women feel that they're penalized, or men, then they're not going to take them. So if it's, a, it's an assumption that I have to be in my chair, in this office. So I think we have to do a dual combination. I think we can't just change policy. And by the way, this for me is very similar to um, this push to have 50-50 representation. If we don't also look at our cultures and how we're respecting people, valuing people, allowing them to achieve what they can, that we, then we may have women just go out the door. Right, so I think that's an important piece as well. Uh, another question before we actually give you a task. There's a couple of questions in the line. Yeah. Uh, my question is to Ambassador Thompson. Um, she did mention that a number of series of trainings have been given to senior management and heads of mission, but she didn't seem to talk about whether trainings have been given to the HR uh, personnel or HR officers, because I think with regard to the comment about constraints of time and pressure to make good quality selection of candidates, I think if the HR were qualified and were to do that, it would take a lot of the burden from the managers and it would just give them the very best to go through and that this would help. Yeah. So we, uh, we just had a suggestion to get a couple of questions at a time and then go. So let's... Hello, my name is Camilla. I work in WHO. I have a quick question around how unconscious is the bias? Because we here in selection panels are very direct biases being spoken out loud. And That's true. is it polite to say unconscious just so that it's more acceptable or is it, is it a reality? So I can answer that almost quickly, but not quickly. Um, Fortune magazine had an article two weeks ago that said unconscious bias is a feeble excuse for prejudice. <laughs> Literally. So, and what I say in any of my sessions is this does not take away any of the blatant prejudice or discrimination that exists. I actually definitely separate this from that. But I do think it's the level of um, creating additional awareness can help. So this does not take away from direct bias. I, I think most people here have already said there is bias, right? So I thank you for that. So one more, and then I, there was another comment, and then we can ask people to answer. Yeah. Um, so, Kate, not too long ago you were talking about gender-based violence down at the Graduate Institute, and I was wondering if we're looking just at gender, um, and beyond, of course we have PSEA, but pulling women into the workforce and considering both Report the Abuse website and the report that was recently released in the UK about women's experiences of bullying and harassment and much more than that, how does this initiative and dialogue extend beyond to some of those more intangible supports or lacks thereof? Great. So can we start and ask and some questions? Yeah, sure. Uh, well, uh, certainly the, the training of HR people is extremely important. But, but you have to realize that the majority of the people are, are not selected by HR staff. Uh, we have the panels 
that we have are the people that are working thematically uh, on, the, on the issues. And uh, as a result of that, it is important not only the HR people, but everybody else. What we have done uh, is not only, uh, as I said, is leadership, including HR director, uh, but, but also uh, at the country level, what we have done is training of several people. It's, it's the whole office, uh, basically, or the managers within the office. So it doesn't matter if it's uh, it are the people that are selecting other people. Um, I think, uh, just very quickly, uh, we have both biases and unconscious biases. Uh, and, and, but I think what is interesting about the unconscious part of it is that everybody assumes that I personally, I don't have it. Uh, every, you, you might have it, but I personally, I don't have it. Uh, and I think that what brings uh, this whole exercise is the realization for all of us that indeed we do have uh, a lot of those and that, that they affect our decision making and our dealing with people all the time. And that if we realize that, maybe we will become better persons. No? Fantastic. Th thank you. Um, thank you, uh, colleague from WHO, for that question. I, I want to be very clear. Um, you know, bigotry, overt bigotry and prejudice has no place in the UN. And when it happens, it, I mean, it, it is uh, prohibited conduct. When it happens, it should be reported, investigated, prosecuted, and disciplinary action should be taken. And if there is any way in, in, in which talk about unconscious bias is instrumentalised to give a sense of permission to that, then uh, that would be the precisely opposite of what we're trying to do. So this is in addition to being very clear about prohibited conduct. This is in addition, in the same way as our conversations about microaggressions is different than assault. Assault is a criminal act and should be taken in that direction, whether it's sexual or physical, and should be reported to the police and duly investigated. My microaggression on a Monday morning <laughs> because I don't really want to come to work. <laughs> but again, that's, oh, look, I'm just using that as an example. I, that is something I have to master. You know, I really have to work on that. And I have to work on it every Monday. Every single Monday. There's not a moment where I suddenly go, oh, I'm no longer as biased towards Monday. <laughs> Do you see, I have to live inside that space. And I think that is what the ways in which bigotry and prejudice overtly express themselves, we, we more or less know how to deal with it. We have to make the place safe for reporting. I'll come to your point. But this, this, this need to be um, eternally vigilant with your internal preferences that at times amount to biases that can then accumulate to prejudice and bigotry, that's a professional discipline. And that, there isn't sort of a, 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 an inoculation you can take. There isn't a moment in time where I can, thank God, thank God, I've learned to love New Zealanders and it's all done. <laughs> <laughs> no, on my bad days and after two beers, I regress. <laughs> you know, so it, to me, that, that's what we're trying to get at. And, and but let me be said, let me be said, same thing on bullying and harassment. Let's be very, very clear about what is uh, prohibited conduct. And let's not think that there is no judgment by the system on this behaviour. What the failure is also for us to create um, a culture that's acute enough for us to feel comfortable and safe in reporting bigotry, bias and prejudice and getting it investigated and getting people accountable for it. So that, that for me is quite precious. The second piece, thank you for uh, drawing connections to our work again because that's effectively what it is. And, uh, the uh, Interagency Steering Committee for Humanitarian Effort has appointed uh, champions on these issues, starting through the lens of sexual harassment, abuse and exploitation. We're actually, um, as one of the champions, uh, I'm uh, privileged to be involved in taking a, setting a, a, a benchmarking exercise right across the humanitarian system explicitly so that we understand not only the incidence and prevalence of violence against uh, both women and men, within the context of the workplace, because it is certainly occurring, but also what measures have we taken at this point to address it? And on the basis of that benchmarking exercise, which will conclude in the next 
week or so. Um, we will be uh, meeting once again with all the focal points across the system to challenge the system to, you know, stand up against this. But we're, you, you can ask systems to do a whole heap of stuff formally. But there must be modelling from the, from the so-called top. Um, if, if, let me be clear on that. That's mm -hmm. true. But ev you know, everybody needs to become complicit in equity, in equality, in intolerance for discrimination. We all have a part to play, and that's part of what I think the video, the gift of the, of the footage is that it's an empowering space. And, and I think Laura and I, with Carl and other colleagues, are trying to say, look, if you stand up, we will stand with you. We'll, we'll have you back. But help us stand up against this nonsense. It's, it's, it, it is so destructive to the UN's effort. So destructive in a world that in a world, in a world, no, in a world where um, you saw you saw this morning what happened to the Paris climate agreement. Mm -hmm. this, is, this is not a world that can afford for us to be part of the problem. But this is not unconscious. <laughs> <laughs> I think he is. Please switch it off. I've got a few things to say. No. No, but you know what I mean. We saw this morning, multilateralism, norms and standards are under threat. We too cannot be made complicit. And one of the most basic norms and standards is we are all born in dignity and in rights. Equal in dignity and rights. No excuses. Nowhere. No one. Make me stop. <laughs> anyway, we're doing stuff. I know. I just want to do one thing, and then I want to get last comments from each of you very quickly. But um, what you have on your chair, the organizers worked on these little sort of uh, forms on your chair. And before I ask the panelists literally to give a short what can they do leaving here, I'd love for all of you just to write down a note. You're taking this away, but you've heard such rich conversation, such honesty, some thoughts. So I would hope one of the takeaways is share the video, right? Yeah, so yeah, you can't yeah. put that, right? Because I just gave it to you. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's an, that's an assume. That's, a, that's just an assumption that I have. That's an, actually an expectation that I have and that you've heard from the panel. So can you just take literally 30 seconds to write down one thing, just from what you've heard, that you can do leaving this room? So you see what it says. Because um, I'm not giving gold stars, none of that. <laughs> this is for you. So you will keep thinking, I'm assured, I hope. Um, so I'm just going to ask the panelists just quickly if we can go down um, the row and sort of say, what, what can you do sort of for the rest of 2017 and forward around this topic? What can you commit to doing? As I started out at the beginning talking about various different elements of, of the processes that we're involved in, where we need to, to, to just more focus. I think that in itself is, is an area where we can start with looking at how we participate in those processes and how we conduct the processes. There was a lot of good tips in the video about setting aside a bit of time at the beginning to be completely equitable across the, across all of the candidates and taking time between them to discuss and to do your evaluation separately to avoid group thing. But simple things like, like ensuring that every one of your panels reviewing, testing, interviewing is in itself diverse, that you have men and women, that you have different cultures involved in that as well, so that you are conscious, you can make more conscious effort to identify areas that might be culturally or gender specific that you can then account for, that you can mitigate. Um, obviously tests in, in different languages. Um, I think having a, a, a more resources for hiring managers in terms of when they're assessing qualifications. I know that UNESCO used to put out a book equivalent with equivalents of degrees in different countries. You can see, look up a degree in any country and sort of see where it stands in, in that, that table. So those kinds of resources would, would help people also. 
Um, and I think something that, that we also kind of falls in between what was raised earlier about the conscious bias or yeah. prejudice and the unconscious <laughs> bias that transpires at all levels, but also, but especially at the management level, is complicity in thwarting the process. Mm -hmm. Shortcuts, turning a blind eye to what you know are deficiencies in the way that the process has been conducted. Sometimes you have to send something back and say, sorry, we can't accept this on, the, on this basis because it's clear that you haven't had the right kind of inputs, the right kind of assessment given to the candidates that are coming forward. Sometimes, again, because of time, pressure, others, we just sort of let it slide. But I think that's an area where we also have to be very much vigilant and, and all of us do our part. All right, thank you. Um, I, I, I think it's enormously important to be accountable mm -hmm. for this conversation. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm rather keen that we, we think about a, an interval, some point in the future where we meet again mm -hmm. to give account to, for what's changed and to hear from you whether you've seen any discernible shift <laughs> in either organisation or beyond. And I, I uh, have the... Uh, the responsibility for trying to lead some conversation around this across the whole of the UN development system. We've won a space which was hard fought for actually to talk about values, norms and standards within the UN development system. And one thing we will uh, undertake through that process is to put these issues at the heart of that conversation as the UN uh, says it is uh, approaching transforming its uh, management system. Thank you. Yeah, I think, well, I think we, we, we need to, to continue doing this. I mean, uh, there, there, there is certainly more things that we can do. I think uh, uh, if we manage at some point to really increase the diversity at the senior management level, of our organizations. Mm -hmm. That will come more naturally. Mm -hmm. uh, we have to get there. Uh, and, and we're really late. Uh, and, and, and we continue to be late yeah. because the, 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 the same cycle is, is kept continuously. Yeah. Uh, and the same uh, people and the same races and the same you know, yeah. white, all. Yeah. Why, 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 why? <laughs> <laughs> selected positions. <laughs> as long as we don't break that cycle, we are going yeah. to continue having the same problem. So we have to be realistic about that. Uh, and I think we are doing a big effort to make it clear and loud to everybody. It's not about numbers. We're not talking about numbers here. We're not talking about nice, politically correct words. We're talking about realities. And we are really good in Geneva to talk about politically correct things. Uh, I'm actually even good at that, yeah. <laughs> if you believe me that. I can be really politically correct. But this is not the objective here. And because we have uh, you know, a, a big in, uh, emphasis in gender issues now in Geneva, and because nobody dares to oppose that, we have very often uh, an absolute consensus of the importance of gender issues without any results. So if we don't really make those changes at the higher level so that we really have diverse managerial teams that are at the high level, we will never get there. So I think, I think our commitment should be to continue in that process, to continue being, in a certain way, you know, the a kind of pain, no? and raising the issue all the time, because it is our role. Uh, I cannot accept to be a woman from a developing country in a high level position and not do anything. And I think we all have the responsibility to do something, absolutely now. Okay. Let's thank the panel. Please. I just want to again thank the
Theodora, Sigori, and Beatrice for all of their work on this. And I'm going to be told not to do that, but I do want to acknowledge them again. And thank you all for being here. So we look forward to coming back and continuing the conversation. Thank you. Thank you.